Hi friends, and welcome to All By My Shelf. I'm Miss Rachel, and it's so nice to see you. Today's panel is Shiver Me Timbers, atmospheric books and how they got that way. If you're not sure what that means, basically an atmospheric book is something where you feel truly like you're in the world. Maybe you're reading a book on a sunny day and all of a sudden it just feels like everything is really foggy because the book is so spooky. That's atmosphere. So the amazing authors that are going to be talking to you about that today are Emily Lloyd-Jones, Lori M. Lee, Alex Astor, Margaret Owen, and Lyndall Clipstone. I hope you enjoy this panel. Timbers panel. Um, I would like to start off by having all of our wonderful panelists introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their book or books, if the case may be. Um, anybody can start. Hi, I'm Kat Scully. I'm the author and illustrator of Jennifer Strange. It's a uh, young adult horror set in Savannah, Georgia, about two sisters who discover that they have terrible powers. It's basically a YA girl, Evil Dead, and the inside's completely illustrated, and it basically made my own Necronomicon. That's fantastic. <laughs> I know. I've been looking at all the illustrations for that on Instagram, and they look beautiful. I'm so excited mm -hmm. to read it. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, it looks, it looks just incredible. <laughs> uh, I can go next. Um, so I'm Margaret Owen. I am legally responsible for this. Uh, <laughs> it's the Merciful Crow, if you can't read it or if it's backwards or if you can't read backwards text, I don't know. No, it's um, coming through forwards. <laughs> yes, thank God. <laughs> um, it is, uh, I like to call it basically Graceling meets Mad Max Fury Road uh, in that it's about a girl from the bottom rung of her society, which is a caste structure who her family kind of gets pulled into what seems to be a wacky hijink plan to save the heir to the throne and then quickly goes very bad when the sole responsibility of her nation and the life of the heir to the throne lands on her very angry and reluctant and resentful shoulders. Uh, and there's a lot of teeth involved. I feel like that's the best summary possible. <laughs> the teeth bit, because we have the same editor. And when I was drafting my my first thing, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, is she going to think it's a bit much? And then no. I read the bit where like they're pulling the teeth out and I'm like, nothing I can no. do can be worse than this. This is great. <laughs> I, so fun story. I knew I was going to get along, not to derail too much. Uh, I knew I was going to get along with Tiff really well when uh, the, so the skin monsters weren't in the original draft. Uh, they were slated for the sequel. And I told Tiff about that, and she was like, can we do the skin monsters earlier? Like, now. And I was I like, love it. right? She's just so encouraging of all the terrible things. That's wonderful. <laughs> right? <laughs> Why don't you tell us about your story? <laughs> yes. I'm Lyndall Clipstone. Um, I'm the author of Lake's Edge, which is now coming out late 2021. Thank you, coronavirus. Um, which I've just sort of in the process of finding out what the new date is still. Um, and it's a gothic romance where a girl goes to live at a haunted estate with the monster of Lake's Edge, who is this terrible boy that has rumored to have murdered his whole family and worshipped some kind of terrible dark power. 
Um, and then when she falls in love with him and realizes that he's actually cursed, she decides to make a bargain with the Lord of the Dead to try and save him. So yeah, it's like lots of kissing scenes and pretty dresses and spooky gardens and there's a cursed lake and yeah, it's been good fun writing it. <laughs> That sounds so good. Um, I'll go next because you said curse and that's in my title. Um, so I'm Alex Astor and I'm the author of the um, upper middle grade fantasy um, Emblem Island Curse of the Night Witch. So it's the first book in a series and it's set on the magical island called Emblem Island where everyone is born with markings on their skin that dictate their fate and their talents. So everyone has a lifeline and everyone's born with an emblem, which is like their superpower or their talent. The main character does not like his lifetime, his lifeline and his lifeline. Um, and he also doesn't like his emblem. So on a magical New Year's Eve celebration where he can wish for another emblem, he does so. And instead of waking up with another emblem, he wakes up with a curse. So um, he and his two friends must cross Emblem Island for the first time to search for the only person who can break his curse which is the Night Witch. And um, there are, there's a book of ancient legends that they have to follow to find the Night Witch. And those are based on Latinx myths um, from my Colombian grandmother who always used to tell us cuentos before bed. Um, and we put those in between the chapters. So like there's like little stories. Oh, it's almost so like cute. a book within a book. Um, so yeah, that's my story. Sounds awesome. <laughs> I really want to read that now. I want to read anyone. All right, I'll go next because my book also concerns a curse. Um, I'm Emily Lloyd-Jones. I am author of The Bone Houses. Unlike Yay. everyone else, I was not as prepared and did not bring a copy. So um, it is about a medieval Welsh village that would be a really idyllic place if there weren't a curse of the undead. And our main character is a grave digger who has to crack down the place where the dead originate. So yeah, it's, bones, bones, it's weird, bones. it's creepy. It's got a lot of Welsh myths in it. It's very me. And there's an undead goat who's their sidekick. So yeah. <laughs> And Ellis, so my goat. favorite. <laughs> I have way too much fun writing Ellis. He's, <laughs> he he's just adorable. Yes, yeah, so cute. <laughs> okay, so I'm Lori M. Lee and I'm the author of Forest of Souls which is a YA fantasy about um, a spy in training who discovers that she has the rare ability to shepherd souls. And that leads her to being tasked with bringing under control um, an ancient forest possessed by vengeful spirits before it devours the kingdoms. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds so good. <laughs> so good. I like all of you so much now. <laughs> all of all what you just said is everything I love. I'm I know. So I want to read I, all of the books. <laughs> this is over. I'm going to be placing like another bookstop order. I just know it. <laughs> what do you all think it takes to make a book feel spooky or unsettling um, or dark? And the answer might be just something like teeth. But it might be, you, know, <laughs> you let me know what, what you think it takes. I mean, teeth I think are it's inherently a, creepy. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's a mix between, like, everyone's, obviously there are a lot of curses and teeth and, like, really scary things that are, like, physically scary. But I think all of our books probably have underlying themes that are a little, like, unsettling. Um, at least in my book, the main character doesn't really like his fate he doesn't know what he wants and so he he's cursed because of that and he has to go on a quest to kind of figure out what he wants and I think be behind every like horror story there's a very real thing that we might not live in a magical island but we all deal with kind of universal themes that can be scary sometimes so I think that every good like um, creepy story has to have like an underlying real theme that is scary for for people in real life. I think that's yeah. very, very true. I think for me, making a book spooky or unsettling is about making the reader look twice at ordinary situations and objects and making them see the negative space around it. Like a door is not inherently creepy, but a cracked door with a dark space behind it can be very spooky. I remember being terrified of my open closet when I was younger <laughs> and it always had to be shut because you don't know what's back there. So I think just 
making ordinary things and just drawing attention to the ways they could be inherently unknown or what could be inside them or nearby. Right. Yeah, that's my favorite sort of, oh, sorry, I cut you off. <laughs> you go, you go. I was going to say, like, when I was doing my, like, undergrad degree at university, one of the, like, critical theorists I studied was Julia Kristeva, um, and her big thing was, like, about objection, which is where, like, something is really unsettling because it's this sort of transgression of the normal, like, the idea of getting a cut and being able to see under your skin or something like that and I feel like there's so much power in taking like the ordinary world or like what should be familiar and turning it into this kind of just slightly off kilter slightly wrong sort of yeah I don't know that's always so much fun to play with right exactly that's that's, that's very close to like <laughs> the, what I was gonna say too uh the the I think where we really see atmosphere come through is when um you have this, you know, readers are going to bring their own baggage and their own ideas of what's normal into a book. And that's something that you can't necessarily control. But there are some things where you're just like, okay, that's how it should be. And then when a reader finds a line where it's not, where the, like a stone is out of place or something, or the stone is out of place and something very upsetting is where that stone is expected to be. Then it's, that's where it's like, oh, this this creepy thing has permeated even the stuff that I take for granted. And now I can't take anything for granted. Like um, the fact that, you know, the crows in the Merciful Crow are paid. Sure, that makes sense. That they're paid in human teeth is like, uh, hey, hold on. <laughs> Pause. Can we, can, we, can we go back and discuss, please, why? Why? You know, it, it's something that's just enough of a little bit of a speed bump. Maybe a large molar-shaped speed bump. <laughs> that sort of throws people off and sets the tone for, you know, what else to expect. <laughs> so that's something I play a lot with in my book. And it's really, I like to take things that might ordinarily be a source of comfort and then kind of turn it just a bit so it's unsettling. And Jennifer has this particular nightlight her mother gave her before she passed away and it's like a constellation lamp and she wakes up in the middle of the night and stopped spinning so it's like having that moment of something isn't right this thing that behaves this one way isn't behaving the way I wanted it to and I actually have the illustration of it of the thing oh, in her that's room so spooky. I love it the hand <gasps> uh. <laughs> And it's foretelling things to come, but it's, it's just, I liked those little things, those everyday ordinary things. And then just turning it a hair where you're like, wait, like what makes you in the middle of the night when the lights are out, go from, oh, my room is safe to, is there someone watching me? And then the hair stands on the back of your arms. And how can I make that happen? And a lot of that really is atmosphere and like playing with something just enough that you start to get unsettled. I also really like playing around with that kind of thing where it's this sort of line between like, is this just in my imagination or is this something that's actually happening? So like in Lake Sedge, like the first night, the main character and her brother spend at the creepy house, they're going upstairs to their room and she's sort of like, I can hear something moving in the walls. I can hear something whispering to me. And she's like, so they're talking and she'll pause and be like, can you, can you hear that? And no one else can. So there's this sort of like, am I just freaking myself out? Maybe I'm just imagining it. Or is the house actually whispering to me? And when you can hear something that everyone else can't, it's just so much fun to play with. Yeah, definitely the unknown provides a lot of opportunities to unsettle the reader. My favorite <laughs> scene in my book that was scary, I thought, was when the two main characters stumble upon a dead body. And it's not that. It's the fact that it's on the very edge of the woods where the woods are cursed the rest of the land is not. So they don't know if at sundown, this body is going to rise and be one of the undead. So they have to wait until sunset with this skeleton going, are we gonna have to fight this soon? And it just, it was so much fun to play with. So um, a lot of us have mentioned like the word atmosphere, right? And I'm, can I pose a question? Is that okay? I'm curious how you guys build atmosphere. Um, like for me personally, I think it's about um, how to engage the senses in a scene. 
Um, like for example, if my characters are going into a creepy forest, right? Um, um, they, they can anticipate that something's going to happen, but um, you sort of, I would sort of slow down the moment, like don't stop the momentum, but slow down the moment and really zero in on uh, just a few details that really um, engage the reader's senses. Like the, like what, what, are, what does the character smell? What do they see? What do they hear? Like um, what is that scratching sound or what is that strange foul smell? Or um, did that tree just move? You know, like, um, so that's how I would create that sense of atmosphere and something is not right. So I'm just curious how you guys approach that. That's such a good so question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would say, uh, you know, it's not necessarily, this isn't necessarily something just for spooky atmosphere, but atmosphere in general is, um, it's not just how, or it's not just what your character senses what they pick up on but how do they react to that like is it in in the book that i turned in a little bit ago um it's you know it's not just oh it's a foggy november night it's okay well this is my least favorite time of year and why is that um you know it's it's how or it, it, it's it's stuff like okay well the the main character will you know put on a charm against bad spirits or something and then you're like okay but why 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 does the charm work and what kind of bad spirits are we talking about here like what what what, what are we what are we looking out for and um i think it's it's looking at how people i think uh atmosphere can really be built when you look at not just the world itself but how people have adapted to live in it <laughs> cat looks like <laughs> you're like yeah. yes I love it. Yes. And I love that Lori brought up the senses because it made me actually think about something I haven't put words to that I do. And it's say we're doing the forest scene, like Lori mentioned. I think about, okay, I've got five senses. Which one are you not going to expect me to use? If oh, you're in a forest, so that's probably taste. What would I taste that would be disgusting in the woods? Probably slimy mushrooms, leaf rot, so you could just be like, I took a breath in and my mouth tasted like, le like leaf rod and rotten mushrooms and something slimy. There must be something in these woods. And then suddenly your hair starts sticking on the back of your arms, right? So I think going for that, whatever someone doesn't expect in the situation to describe it with a sense is so strong because they go, oh, you know, it's an immediate reaction. That's amazing. I love it. It's always such like this, I always find like I really want everything to feel very cinematic and so I've kind of got this idea of like I do like a look of a little visual inspiration and things like that and trying to translate that sort of feeling of like a very cinematic experience into like prose is such a challenge but the senses stuff really works and I love that. Um, I do really similar what Laura, to what Laurie said where you like really slow down the scene at particular moments and it's so fun when you get to like a point where you're like okay I'm just gonna really like zero in on every single like minute little detail and really sort of dig in and get like really really tense and close to everything and how everyone's feeling and that was like my favorite parts to write because it's just so I don't know like I guess like atmospheric is probably the only real word to describe it this visceral sort of like tense emotional sort of closeness in prose so fun um for me i think a lot of atmosphere in prose is word choice and i don't remember who said this so if anyone knows the origin of this quote please tell me um there's a big difference between saying like cottage in a forest and cabin in the woods so a <laughs> lot of atmosphere for me in prose is trying to figure out exactly what word is going to send chills down your spine and it's always yeah. such a nice feeling when you lie on like the perfect word to when you're just like, yes, that just fits so well. Yeah, I think um, drawing upon what everyone has said, especially with like quests, if you have like a fast moving story, it's really hard to know when to slow down. I think like the biggest challenge I had like writing 
this book is that is a quest and they have a limited time span. So how do you get them to these places without making it seem like every time, okay, like how, how many times can you describe that they walked somewhere, that something happened? And so I think when you're, when you have these fast moving scenes, there's a lot of power in kind of picking exactly what you're going to point out because when most of it's action, and then you decide just in the middle of a fight scene for the main character to smell something, to smell blood, or to have this eerie feeling because of something he touched. I think that's really powerful um, when, you, when you pick and you choose and you insert in a place, and it's not at the beginning of a chapter when you're, that's a little different when you're setting the atmosphere of, oh, they're on this pirate ship, or they're on, um, in this world within the island, um, and then you get really into the, the fast pace part of the scene and then you stop for a second and I think we've all had that moment where you're you're like having fun you're like okay what would you actually in this fight scene like what do you hear do you hear the metal clinging together of the swords um but it's definitely atmosphere that's such a good question Lori okay um so next question um and one I want to just take the time to point out, because I don't think you mentioned it in your intro. Kat, you've also done some map designing, right? For fantasy books? Yes. Okay. I've done a lot. I think I have one on my wall downstairs. Um, I have a stack with me. <laughs> right next to me. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, I did an a, a interview earlier with YATL, and they wanted me to, like, show my map. So I have this stack. These are all the maps oh, wow. I, like, worked oh, on. That's so cool. Not every single one. There's a bunch more that I did just with pre-order campaigns, but. Amazing. Yeah, I've, I've been very fortunate. I got to work with all these fantastic writers and build their worlds and make their maps. And so what I'm curious about for all of you is if your <laughs> characters were the first thing that came to you or your world, like your world building. Or if it was kind of a combination of they just sort of arrived in a nice package for you and your brain said, open me. For me, it's kind of cyclical. Like they build one on the other. Um, I, w I would say that um, they would like, f f I would say Phi definitely came first. Like I just had this image of what, you know, what, what would a per the person who's almost like a crow personified be? Like, you know, someone who's curious and belligerent and kind of irreverent. <laughs> uh, and then I was like, okay, but what, what kind of world would make someone like that? And then it would be like, or then from there it would go into, okay, so how, I've, you know, I've created this world. Let's take this another step deeper and investigate and flesh out how that impacts, you know, like how, how that goes deeper than just, you know, okay, well, she's, you know, angry and belligerent and, and grumpy and all those fun things. But really, how does that inform who she is and what, what cultural norm she, she is? And so I find that, you know, the, the character comes first, then the world, but then the character in response to the world, if that makes sense. Mine is like a hundred percent characters. Like I always kind of feel like I usually start with like a romance dynamic because that's my favorite thing to write. <laughs> um, and like Lake Search is kind of tricky because like I've talked a little bit about it um, on Instagram recently, but like it, yeah, I sort of worked on it for maybe more than 10 years. So I didn't really have this moment of like sitting down to kind of, okay, here's my idea for drafting a book. But the third book that I've been writing, which is like um, a new series, I kind of had this like, okay, I want, a romance dynamic that feels like Raylo and I want them to get like to both have magic and have their magic swapped and to hate each other but have to team up to like reluctantly team up to fix everything so then it's kind of like okay cool I've got this so now it's like packing the world around like how can I sort of pack plot and world around this to sort of scaffold the the characters so yeah it's interesting like when people sort of do world first because I've always kind of like my worlds are really fun to build but it's definitely not the first thing I guess it's kind of similar to what you said where you have a particular type of character and then you're like okay so what sort of world would be there to make them like this and to get the best kind of like reactions out of them as they go through the story I always build my worlds first because I'm that person who really likes world building <laughs> Yeah, so I always, 
end up probably spending way too much time on the world because I usually consider the world itself a character and so I will draw out all of the absurd details that no one needs and then from there I kind of like I think of the characters as seeds that I kind of plant in the world and they grow out of it and I can't really imagine character and how they'd react and what they would do unless I knew exactly where they grew up like the situations they found themselves in so it's definitely world first then characters for me. I don't have a um well okay it never happens the same way for me <laughs> it's um i love world building um and for force of soul specifically i you know i actually can't remember because well, the first draft i wrote for nano rimo back in like 2014 my memory doesn't work that far back um so i actually don't remember but i i'm gonna echo what molly said in that um it, the character and the world to sort of build on each other because I had this idea of, um, for sure I know I had this idea of, of what I wanted um, the character to be able to do, but I hadn't refined it yet until I um, came up with specifically like the forest and then how that all played together. So it definitely built on each other, but there's, but I've also definitely had instances like with my previous series where I came up with the idea of this girl who could manipulate time and then um, just based off of that, I had to build the world around her. So it definitely varies from book to book. It varies for me too, um, because I think you either have a very strong sense of the world or a strong sense of the character. I've never had both, um, but for this one definitely was the world. Um, I really thought it was interesting to have a world where everyone is born with a marking that determines their fate. And it was kind of hard to do the characters after that because these characters, obviously their entire life is wrapped up in their markings. And so it was, it was hard um, to determine what powers or talents or responsibilities every person is born with because that's kind of like deciding their personality. So um, I definitely came up with the world first and it was based on a um, Latinx myth called La Niña con la Estrella en um, la Frente, which means the girl with the star on her forehead. And so I kind of got the idea of like in the myth, the girl earns the star for doing something good and then her sister earns horns because she does the opposite. And so I really like the idea of someone earning a marking um, based on their behavior or something that they did. So that influenced the world with obviously like the marking on their skin, but also the fact that Tor Luna, the main character, makes a bad choice and is punished. And he has a, a dark emblem or a, a marking that um, is like a deadly one so the world definitely came first but i agree with Lori. i think all of us have had ideas before where it starts with something different and it surprises you every time and, it, and you just have to build off of whatever your head gives you first so with my book it was with jennifer and i want to say that each of my books has had like okay the setting came first or the character came first or sometimes both come at the same time but jennifer has a weird story because i wrote her for my tv pilot writing class my senior year when i was graduating 2009 and i went and pitched my professor and said i'd like to write a tv show about a skeptic and a, and a believer who solves supernatural cases and he said to me i want you to go to the library and rent the X-Files and then get back <laughs> to me. And trust me, the irony that I married my husband, his name is Scully, is not lost on me. But <laughs> so I went and I went back to my dorm room and I read Watchmen and I got this idea like Jennifer formed in my head because I sketched her out and I drew her. I just kept drawing and drawing until the characters formed themselves on the page for me. And I went, that's it. And I saw Jennifer, I saw uh, Marcus and originally Liz wasn't her sister but her aunt and that she goes to stay with her aunt and I changed it to be closer so it's her big sister and it's so weird that like sometimes if I get stuck on the scene I have to draw it like I have to sketch it out and do a storyboard and maybe that's because I studied so much um, screenwriting in my undergrad where I'm just like oh storyboard the beats out um, but it's so interesting to me, everyone else's process, because mine always so heavily involves art. And I don't know any other way to do it. 
I was going to ask, do you, do you find that, um, it's hard to get a grasp on a character until you've really drawn them out? Yes. Yeah. I find it very hard to see them unless I've drawn them. And even Mm -hmm. if the drawing's really bad, like I have journals and journals of all the revisions I've done of Jennifer's (laughs) brain where I couldn't figure out the ending of the book. So I drew it and I drew uh, what it looked like and where it was and with Jennifer, I didn't know I was going to set it in Savannah, Georgia at all. Um, I just kind of went, okay, I need the place that this idea is set to be as much an antagonist as Jennifer's own powers. So she's fighting herself and she's fighting the landscape. And I was like, what better place? I was like the most haunted cities in America, Savannah, Georgia. And I lived in Georgia at the time. I went down. Um, I have a friend who her husband is Johnny Mercer's great, 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 great grandnephew. And they gave me a tour of Savannah and I'm like, this is it. This is where the book is being set. Um, But I've written other books where I'm like, oh, I know it's going to be set in a public park in these places, but who lives there? So the place came first. It's just different with every idea, I think. It just depends on what the idea is. I love the drawing there because I do that as well like I've got all of my really old notebooks where I've drafted stuff and I've got like little sketches in the margins of other people's faces and things like that and like I've just pulled this this is my I don't know if you can see it my beautiful like professional map that I sketched when I was doing my revisions because I needed them to like travel so I'm like I'm gonna have to draw this so like I can visualize where like everybody's villages are and stuff. But yeah, it's fun looking back through all my old notebooks and seeing these little like faces that I've drawn in the margins and things like that, because it does help when you're feeling stuck. I've definitely had to, I found that I have to draw a map before I start drafting or before I get too far into drafting, because I mean, with Merciful Crow, it was non-negotiable simply because the entire thing is a road trip. So it was like, (laughs) well, let's make sure that I'm not giving them a week to walk five feet. And let's also make sure that they're not leaping across a mountain range in the space of five minutes. But um, just in general, I found that it also helps with the drafting process and also just to sort of build the world itself too and the atmosphere uh, to have this map to refer back to and be like, okay, well, now they're in one of the more wealthy districts. What is this going to look like? Now they're in an, an administrative, like, you know, by City Hall, what does this area look like? And so I can, I can, as I'm drawing this map and like, you know, nailing down different details. It's like, okay, well, let me, let me actually flesh this out and figure out some details about this particular area and the setting that I can introduce to help sort of give the, give the world a little bit more flavor when they're in the scene. Yeah, drawing the map definitely helped me because like I have always sort of worried that my book is kind of like small because it's set in like a house pretty much, but they sort of go, (laughs) but that's so gothic anyway, like it's fine. But the sort of, so drawing the map helped me kind of give this sort of sense of like dimension to what is like a very small world, like letter goes from like her village to another village to the house and that's kind of it. But then even just sort of working with like the fluctuations of the landscape. So there's like this really big pine forest near her village, which is where she was found as a child and where she first met like the Lord of the Dead. And then they travel to like Lake Sedge, which is like sort of granite stone hills and a big lake and the village around there like grows almond trees. So there's orchards and just being able to sort of visualize how like those little fluctuations would kind of change, even though it's not like a grand, huge journey, there's still changes and working all that in definitely gave it a bit more of a sense of like being less of a white room sort of world, I guess. So in terms of world building as well, um, one of the things within all of your books is there's the sort of sense of like magic or supernatural, like some, some otherworldly element. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the way that that is manifested within your books. Um, is it like monsters? Is it a freaky forest, a giant spider king? Is it a um, teeth? I don't know. <laughs> I get stuck on the teeth a lot, um, but is it something else? Like, can you talk just a little bit about what that magic is in your world? I know, Alex, you've already talked about it a little with the different emblems, but if there's anything else to add to that. Um, I guess to add to the emblems, um, I showed you guys before the cuentos or the stories in between the chapters, and 
basically to get to the night witch they have to encounter all of these horrible monsters and a lot of those are based on um, Latinx myths like La Pata Sola, La Siguapa, La Llorona. Um, so La Siguapa is um, a legend about women who like can control their long creepy hair like whips and it's they're very monstrous and so those are um it's an example of like one of the many monsters that are obviously like supernatural that are in the book um so yeah it has a lot of monsters and just because the world is like totally fantasy I think it's cool that you can play around but it is interesting because um even though they live in a totally different like mystical world they are afraid of very similar things that like people who don't live in a world like that are. So yeah, there's definitely lots of monsters in my book. Okay, so the, um, the way the magical system works in my book is um, inspired by monk shamanism. Um, so there's the belief that um, spirits influence the world around us and like when we get sick or, um, when bad things happen it's some something to do with like maybe there's a bad spirit around you or maybe your own spirit is lost or whatever right um and then there's also the idea that when shamans go into the spirit realm they can actually summon familiars other spirits in order to help them so building off of that um in Forest of Souls, the, the shamans, they can't use their magic unless they have a bond with a familiar. So that's how the magic works in the world. And I wanted there to be that specific limitation because whenever I'm messing with magic or whenever I introduce magic, it's very easy to be like, to do something unexplained and be magic you know <laughs> like so there has to, there always has to be a rule or there, there always has to be rules for me me personally um there always has to be rules there always has to be limitations and there always has to be um I guess it just always has to make sense There's, there has to be a certain logic to the magic even though it is magic you know Yeah, I would say um, I had a similar approach with Merciful Crow where the magic is, um, it's, it's got rules and limitations and not everybody can use it, but any, everybody sort of ambiently benefits from that. But I also wanted to engage with this idea that um, I don't see explored a ton where if you have a world with different kinds of magic, uh, the fact that a kind of hierarchy would form around that, which is the basis for the caste system, in that people are born into these castes and they are born with what has become known as a birthright, which was a very loaded and very specific term because it becomes part of their identity and becomes part of their culture and who they think they are and how they think that makes it okay to treat other people. And um, yeah, so I wanted to engage with this idea of magic as a cultural as a cultural marker and as, as a status symbol um, in a world where that deter like what what caste you are born into and what powers you have determines well specifically you know what where your place is in society and doesn't kind of shy away from the uglier sides of that um, so magic is kind of omnipresent in the merciful crow because everybody has some kind of ambient ability um, except for the the main character's cast, which is the crows, who are perceived to have no ability whatsoever, uh, except for the few people in their cast who are born with the ability to steal the, the lingering magic from other people's bones. And uh, it's it was deliberately a kind of gauche taboo kind of power where you have to take, you know, the, you have to use the remains of somebody to, to tap into power that was hypothetically never, you know, you, you don't have a, a claim to, but at the same time, um, it's, and we get into it a little bit more in the second book, but it's, it's, it's part of a cycle. Uh, let's put it that way. <laughs> But yeah, I wanted, you know, I, I wanted this world where magic was almost a kind of capital too. And uh, it look, we looked at magic as it would um, impact a society, especially when there is different kinds of it. I loved how interwoven it was in your book. Like it was such a <laughs> cool you. way of seeing it because I guess like so often you sort of like this kind of magic and then the society and it was like so 
it was so cool how it was such a big part of like the cast system and everything. It really, so much depth. I love that. <laughs> I think it, it was definitely, it was a lot of fun to think about um, also the reality of where different powers would land in a, in a society where the most destructive one is the one that is considered the most, like it's, it's the, the power of the royalty and it's fire. And they're the only ones who have an overtly destructive power. And they're also the only ones who have an immunity to fire. Which was like, oh, it's a privilege metaphor, everybody. But uh, <laughs> it was, you know, it was it was fun to think about in terms of that, and like, okay, so what's the next most powerful group, and you know, or what are the next most powerful groups? Well, you have the nobility whose power, or the, the the bureaucracy, you know, and they're they're they form a lot of the sort of political. They they engage in a lot of the political back and forth. Their power is illusions. And, uh, you know, the, the power or the, the military was kind of the, the, the cast that is generally uh, thrown into the military uh, line, line of work is technically healers. And I, that was definitely a big choice because I wanted to be like, this is a country that says, oh, my God, we've got people who can heal others. Let's make them super soldiers instead Let's of, you know, weaponize it. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it, it was, that was something where I wanted to establish or to set to set a tone for this is the kind of choices that are being made by the people in power in this world who are responsible for upholding this hierarchy, this, this caste structure. But, uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was talking a little bit about my magic system, I guess. Um, so I'm trying to remember the question. Now my brain's on the thing where it's swapped off. Um, I kind of had this very, very bastardized version of my, the sun's coming right through the window now. Um, <laughs> this very bastardized version of alchemy, which like, I feel, there's a couple of other books coming out in the next like year or so that have actual alchemy in it. And I'm like, oh, please don't look too closely about what I've done. So it's kind of like a little bit of a cross between like tattoo magic and alchemy where um, there's, the alchemists are kind of like maesters from Game of Thrones, where they live in a commune called the Maylands, which is a little bit like the weird commune in Midsummer, but without the like killing people. <laughs> Just, yeah. Um, so they're kind of like, I guess I wanted it to be like this ivory tower, like academic kind of, so they're all up in the Maylands doing like research, whatever. And most villages don't have like they know magic exists but they don't use it like they have like a healer or something um so alchemists channel the light that runs through the world so the there's like this big sort of intersection between religion and magic in the the religious world building is that the lady made the world by turning into like golden light which is now runs through the world so when people pray they put their hands in the ground and kind of tune in to the light and alchemists use that to cast, so they draw on that to cast magic. Um, and what kicks the whole story off is the main character's brother has dark alchemy. So his power isn't coming from the lady, it's coming from the Lord Under, which is kind of like everybody's sort of afraid of him because there's this kind of superstition that if you walk close to death and the Lord of the Dead sort of like sees you and lets you go, you're kind of marked by him forever. So you're kind of tarnished. So his magic is sort of seen as tarnished and dark. And so they're trying to hide it to the point where like the book opens with like letter the main character being like he's having a nightmare there's these creepy shadow monsters that come into our room it's definitely not my brother having dark magic not at all it's like monsters it's nightmares um <laughs> so normal alchemists will draw like sigils on their skin to make the spell and that's kind of like where the alchemy part comes into it where it's like the uh, like you need particular combination of alchemical symbols to cast a spell and then you draw it as a sigil and then when you cast the spell it becomes like forever marked onto your skin so like the alchemist character has like her arms sort of covered in like a whole lot of tattoos um but what i really liked about it was this sort of idea of this like there's sort of a scene where like the Leila is talking about magic and she's like it makes sense that something so big and powerful should leave a mark on you forever but it's also like kind of unsettles her like the prospect of that and when like her brother starts using the magic and she sees that he's got sigils on his arms now she's just like oh there's no going back from this now um but I really liked how it kind of got tied up in um 
when she started using magic because kind of like the plot twist was that she had this buried magic that she didn't really know about so she sort of has this moment of like this is the first time I'm drawing like a sigil once I've done this like I'm gonna have it on me forever and then she, when she makes a bargain with the Lord of the Dead, like he marks her hand with like a different sort of sim symbol as well. So she's got like a crescent shaped scar from where she cuts her hand to make the bargain with him. And as she goes through the book, she's becoming more and more marked. So she's got like a scar in her hand. She's got like the sigil that she uses to cast a spell. She ends up with like another sort of weird sigil that she uses later on at like the, the end of the book to sort of stop something terrible happening. And um, there's this kind of like, I don't know, I really love this sort of idea that like you're kind of like physically changed by your actual like emotional arc through the plot, if that makes sense. That doesn't really answer the question about monsters in the book, but I do have a very cute little picture that I drew of a lot under drinking a cup of tea. <laughs> so he's the bad guy, but he's also kind of cute. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I have a very similar magic system to what you all are describing with skin. I wanted to take a genre that I love, which is the chosen one, like girl with powers, and do something I would find interesting, which is give her a really terrible power. <laughs> one that's like a super villain power. And I wanted to see what would she do with this. And there's actually a hint about this in the cover, but the cost of her power is right on her hands. So every time she uses her gift, she is slowly eaten and this gold mark spreads up her body as she's being pulled over to the other side, to ghosts and to demons. And what Jennifer can do is say a ghost is floating by and if she touches it with her hand, she can give it a body. She can like give it new life again, but she can also do that with demons. And so ghosts and demons are kind of coming after her, trying to cross over because that's all they want to do. And I spent a lot of time researching like the stories from the Warrens, Ed and Lorraine Warren are from The Conjuring, um, Ralph Sarchi, who was a police officer in New York. Um, that was the um, guy that was the lead of Deliver Us From Evil. He used to hear the doors before something supernatural or demonic would happen. And he was the New York branch of the Warrens, which is interesting. And I went down this whole rabbit hole and I was like, what if I did that, but made it like this combination of horror, but also dark fantasy and make my demons as scary as something from a horror movie like The Conjuring, but then give her some sort of fantastical power. Um, but I really wanted it to have a cost. I wanted it every time she crossed something over that it took something back. So it's that sort of, as above, so below power. And her older sister, Liz, has the opposite gift. She can banish anything. But every time she uses it, she also gets pulled over. So she has a silver mark. So on the cover of the arc, this is actually one of the covers I designed that we got tossed on the cutting floor, but this is, Liz is losing, like she becomes silver. And Jennifer becomes gold every time they use their gift. And if their whole body gets enveloped, they're gone. They become a spirit themselves. And they are both fighting, trying to stop their gift from happening, try to keep the ghosts away from them, and, you know, trying to figure out why this is happening at all in the first place. So you're kind of reading this journal from uh, their dad and their mom while you're following along with their story, which is why it's part journal, part book. And I came up with my own symbology. I came up with my own everything because I didn't want to borrow from any culture and like misappropriate it and misuse it. I did not want to do that ever. So I decided to just make my own system and it took a long time and a lot of work, but I'm really glad I did because now it's got like its own protection banishment symbols against ghosts and demons and you have to figure out why their dad knows the symbols at all. And it's a whole rabbit hole I'm excited to explore in books two and three. And I'm going to have necromancy and witches. And it's going to be so fun. Emily, I love how everyone's got these super elaborate like magic systems. And I'm sitting over here like, I never explain the magic in my world. <laughs> my magic is... <laughs> Um, in the bone houses, it's sort of just like the weather. You can't control it. You can only hope to occasionally defend yourself from it. And it's a thing that is completely not human. It belongs to 
the other folk, which were these sort of fae-like immortal creatures that deserted the area over a hundred years ago. However, they didn't take all of it with them, so there's occasional like magical artifacts around, and it's the magical equivalent of like nuclear waste because it can <laughs> screw things up really badly. And so it's just I never actually explain how it works or any of it. The characters just know it is dangerous. Treat it with care. If you use it, things can go terribly, terribly wrong. And they do, of course. They do, of course. Um, so we are <laughs> out of time. <laughs> um, but I would love it if you all could just uh, reiterate your name, your book, um, and where people can find you on your websites or social media, <laughs> on the internet as a whole. That would be great. Okay, great. Um, I'm Alex Astor. This is my book, um, Emblem Island, Curse of the Night Witch. It's the first book in the Emblem Island series. Um, and my website is astorverse.com. And I have a cool, like, which emblem are you little quiz on there and little, like, explanations for the, the top emblems that are explored in the book. But thank you so much for having me. And Alex, Alex, when is, when is it out? Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you. Um, it's out next month, June 9. Um, I want to hear when everyone else's books are out too, because I'm so excited. But yes, so Emblem Island is out next month, June 9. And you can um, pre-order it, obviously, right now. We have a partnership with two independent bookstores where if you pre-order them, you get these cool um, magnetic book clips with the characters on them. And obviously like you support an independent bookstore. So, um, but yeah, so the bookstores are books and books and um, you can just pre order right there. Thank you. Also, I will have to do that because that looks amazing. And uh, so I am Emily Lloyd-Jones. I wrote The Bone Houses. Um, it is already out. So feel free to purchase wherever books are sold or go, you know, um, the audiobook is also great. Um, Libro FM is a wonderful audio program online that supports independent bookshops, and I always try to support them whenever I can. And yeah, so happy to be here with you guys. Okay, so I'm Lori M. Lee, and this is Forest of Souls. Um, it is out June 23rd, and you can find me at lauriemlee.com or on Twitter at lauriemlee, where I'm always posting ridiculous things. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> I am Margaret Owen, also known as Molly sometimes. Uh, I have this, which is already out, Merciful Crow, and uh, the sequel, The Faithless Hawk, will be out at the end of July is currently the plan. Um, and uh, without spoiling too much, uh, look for some news on things about pre-ordering things uh, around the 15th of this month. Uh, we might have something really cool lined up for that. And if you would like to get a jump on that, I would also, wink wink, uh, suggest looking at third place books big wink for ordering your <laughs> pre-ordering the faithless hawk uh, because i may wink have some things <laughs> in mind for that um but yes uh that so merciful crow is already out and if you want to read cool books about teeth uh i got you covered uh the faithless hawk won't be out until the end of july but uh time is a construct right now so that'll be tomorrow i guess and thanks for having um, me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Lyndall Clipstone. My book is Lake's Edge, and it will be out sometime in 2021. I guess I will keep everyone posted. <laughs> um, you can find me on lyndallclipstone.com, and that has links to all my social media stuff. And I'm on Twitter as writer Lyndall. Um, yeah, so I guess. I have no idea when I'll have like any sort of pre-order cover anything probably not too early next year now but I do have a Goodreads link which is probably like kind of exciting <laughs> and yeah sometimes I share little bits about the book and what I'm working on so yeah and I'm Kat Scully and I'm the author and illustrator of Jennifer Strange which is out July 21st 
and I'm doing a pre-order campaign with Copper Dog Books. I don't know if I'm going to go social distance sign or if we're going to do book plates, but there is going to be really cool pre-order swag. I'm going to have an enamel pen of Blackwell Antiques, which is the haunted, super haunted antique shop from the rival family of Jennifer Strange. There's going to be a patch, a protection patch with the one I designed that um, they wear in the book to keep ghosts and demons away. So you too can keep ghosts and demons away. Um, and there's going to be some other surprises. I'm waiting to hear back on maybe some custom nail polish and character bookmarks. And I'm so excited. Um, but that's with Copper Dog Books. And if you want to find me or my art or anything, I'm the same name on everything. It's at Cat M. Scully. It's Scully like Dana Scully, cat with a C. Um, and my website's the only thing that's dif different. It's Catherine with two E's, scully.com. Um, but thank you so much. You all are amazing. I feel so excited. I got to be in a panel with all of you and your amazing books. It's wonderful. Hey y'all, thanks so much for tuning into this panel. If you're looking for more panels like it, make sure you check out the All By My Shelf playlist on our YouTube page. It'll tell you all of the different panels that you're able to watch.